Hey everyone, Ariel Adams here with the Superlative Podcast. My guest today is Andrew Siegel. He is the COO of Hamilton Jewelers, a uh, a multi store, uh, multi brand retailer here in the United States. Andrew, welcome. Ariel, it's really nice to be here with you. Pleasure. My immediate thought of one of your stores is the one in Princeton, New Jersey, more or less across the street from uh, the famous school. <laughs> there and, it is. We're right there. And you and your family so kindly invited me one time uh, on a special weekend where I think it was an alumni weekend or something like that, where a, a, a bunch of people uh, came from out of town even. And um, it, was, it, was, it was a real hoot. And I remember then thinking, boy, I wish every watch brand CEO in Europe could come and just sort of see this because this is a cultural experience unlike anything they could imagine, unlike anything they have in the United States, and unlike what they probably think selling a luxury watch is is, is sort of like. Do you, uh, do, you, do you agree on that? What do you remember about that time? You know, I'm, I'm glad you bring that up because that is when we first met. And, you know... <laughs> Princeton reunions, uh, that's, that's, that was the weekend. And in and of itself is a unique time. Uh, it's, people say it's, it's uh, second only to the Indy 500 in terms of the amount of partying and people and all <laughs> gathering. I mean, the town of Princeton literally uh, doubles in size. And what happens during that time is people from all over the world, obviously you mentioned Princeton University, famous university, lots of different types of alums and and people who are coming in all into town and and people all over the world and they all descend onto essentially our corner. And what you find is when you get a lot of people from around the world together, you find a lot of watch people and a lot of people who really like jewelry, but really a lot of watch geeks. And those people love coming to our store because it feels like home. And for one time a year when they're visiting and 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 they know they're going to be in town for that Princeton reunions weekend, they come. They come and they see us, and it is truly a remarkable weekend. And I, I think, in a way, you're 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 right. I, I I always tell people if you haven't experienced that weekend, it's it's something to behold. Um, and more importantly for us, it's an opportunity to reconnect. Right? I mean, our store in in Princeton. We sell to, to people in all 50 states and all around the world. And, and, and Princeton really is a destination town, especially on the East Coast. But um, uh, we have a really lucky opportunity uh, afforded to us that weekend to really have, have, make it a gathering time, right? A time to, to get people together. And, and uh, it's, it's fantastic. We're, we're, we're lucky to have it. It's really cool, and it's it's so great that your store gets to uh, to just be there. Uh, but before we get ahead of ourselves here, I want you to actually tell the audience a little bit more about the store in terms of uh, when it was founded and by who and what the sort of theme is, and also uh, where are the locations of the stores? Of course, yeah. Um, so uh, our company was founded in 1912, uh, Hamilton Jewelers. It was uh, founded as uh, a small store in Trenton, New Jersey. We, the, the owner of the store at that time, uh, was selling everything from small diamonds and uh, pocket watches to Zippo lighters and uh, leather goods. And there was even an, op- an optician on staff, which is sort of the way things were back in the early 1900s. If you owned a store, you were sort of had to be a Swiss army knife, jack of all trades. My great grandfather purchased the business in 1927. Um, and uh, we really haven't looked back ever back ever since. It's been uh, an unbelievable ride, as you might imagine. Purchasing a business right before the Great Depression was not the easiest thing, and he had to really overcome a lot of adversity early on. Really leaned on those Zippo lighters as opposed to diamonds for a little while there during the Depression, and then uh, we expanded, sort of got out of that that tough period, and, and expanded from there. Um, we now have, uh, we've closed our Trenton location a long time ago. We have, uh, uh, locations here in Princeton, New Jersey, where I'm coming to you from. We also have Palm Beach, Florida on beautiful Worth Avenue, uh, an amazing, amazing street, uh, amazing, amazing luxury shopping and, and experiences there. We have another store a little bit North of that store in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, 
Um, and we also have branched off into a few other business units. We have um, a home store here in Princeton for home goods, luxury home goods, gifts for the home, bridal registries, things like that called Hamilton Home. We have a vintage store that sells vintage watches and antiques and pre-owned jewelry called H1912. Um, and then we have a specialty division that uh, sells essentially business to business and, and takes care of business gifts and gifting programs, uh, high-end gifting programs for universities and, and pharmaceutical companies and all of those things. So things have changed throughout the year, but I'm lucky and, and privileged enough to be the fourth generation uh, of my family who is uh, leading this company. And I do so with my father still uh, and an amazing team of executives who um, you know, keep us on the straight and narrow and, and, and an amazing team of people in our stores who uh, really have these deep relationships with our clients um, and to help, help them celebrate their moments every day. Thanks for explaining all that. One of the things I noticed um, leads me to a question that I actually think is quite interesting to, to discuss. Hearing about the, I'll call them expansive services and things like that, that, that the company has offered in addition to selling sort of watches and jewelry, I asked myself, is that A, more things that the people you already do business with want, so you're able to sort of give them more services, or B, natural areas to open up to do business with new demographics in addition to the ones that you're already selling watches and jewelry to? And I actually don't really know the answer, and I'd be very curious to hear it. Yeah, the short answer is yes, right? So, so, <laughs> so, 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 so we, you know, I think it started as... Um, you know, the initial thought was, okay, well, how do we expand? How do we reach new people, right? New people who maybe might not even be considering walking into a jewelry store or looking for something that's new. So let's sell them something that's pre-owned or pre-loved or, or a vintage piece that's really cool. You know, how do we reach new businesses who are looking to, to celebrate their own employees and uh, create uh, create milestone programs for them? But I think what we found through the process is that um, there's a lot of overlap. Um, a lot of our clients are business owners. Um, a lot of our clients are decision makers in their, uh, in their fields and, and want to recognize their, their employees or their, the team members that they have who work with them. Um, and a lot of people who love new jewelry are also, you know, have their interest sparked by vintage jewelry. And, uh, especially over the last few years when sometimes it's a little bit tougher to get a new watch, um, or a little bit longer of a wait, a lot of people said, hey, I want to, instead of going out there and trying to find a watch on my own from a pre-owned market that I don't know much about, I'd rather buy it from from someone I trust. And, and you know, we found that there was a lot, of, a lot of overlap in those clientele. Trust is a theme that I think we'll approach a few times in this conversation. It is so important because it is that special, magic, difficult-to-define substance that needs to exist between the person selling a luxury product and the person buying it, without which the process, the transaction, the relationship doesn't really happen. And I want you to sort of mention at any opportunity the things that you do to develop trust. And the reason I mention this is because, A, the United States luxury consumer has so much options that <clears throat> without trust, they're just not going to buy anything because you can, you can advertise just about anything in this country. I think it's important for people to remember that you can have an advertisement in America that's more or less a bold-faced lie. Don't get me wrong. There are fraud protection laws, but like sure. it's completely okay, also in politics, <laughs> to just, again, market something that is a bold-faced lie. You can claim its opinion, hyperbole, whatnot. And we sort of leave it up to the consumer to sort of be like, good luck out there, <laughs> caveat emptor. <laughs> and so when yep. it comes to spending a lot of money, you want to... You want to be able to distinguish those situations where you can trust that transaction that you're not going to look foolish or you're like, wait a minute, am I buying snake oil? Mm -hmm. And so folks like Andrew and his family, my, and my guess is that these remain multi-generational businesses because you have some type of special formula to develop trust in a market where it's both necessary and difficult to create. Yeah, I, I, I think you're, you're right. And, uh, you know, there are wow, there are a lot of horror stories out there about, about, you know, that snake oil. Right. And, and I think, you know, we like to tell people and, and we work on this, uh, it feels like every day. Uh, so it's not automatic, but we like to tell people that, that we haven't been around for, um, 112 years for, for nothing. Um, we work hard at that, but without our customers, they're, without our clients who trust us, 
there would not be a Hamilton. I mean, let, let's be clear. I, I, I think, you know, you mentioned the consumer in the U.S. has so many options. We're we're very open to the fact that our, our clients can shop anywhere. Um, they travel. They, I mean, our our stores are in South Florida and the Northeast in the United States. There are plenty of options, and so what we work at every single day is the product is important. And yes, we make our own jewelry and it's beautiful. And we are partnered with some of the finest watch brands in the world. And and we're lucky to have those partnerships. But for us, I'm going to use a word that's overplayed in our industry. The experience is important, but it's more than just having an experience. You have, it has to be memorable. We have to be memorable and our clients have to be memorable to us. What do you, what do you want to remember about them? And what do you want them to remember about you? So, if there is something that is interesting when a client comes in, uh, they will they will remember that for a long time. I don't care if it's something that you have in common in terms of your likes or interests or uh, somewhere you've traveled to uh, that's the same place or you're connecting on the fact that you both like chronographs or uh, you're connecting because you like a certain type of wine. Uh, if, if someone leaves the store with a smile uh, and they remember something about the associate that they worked with, that mm. immediately has provides a connection. It's not just that they got a beverage when they walked in. It's not just that the store was beautiful. Um, we believe that that being memorable to the client makes a little bit of a, a that additional sort of edge. And for us, we need to remember everything about the client. I got I got I got to bring this up right now because yeah. When I used to spend more time going into watch retailers, I don't do it as much these days, I guess because if, if I have like a reason, I'll go. But I used to remember that there's lots of instances where I guess for no specific fault of anyone, but, but there's something about that experience which is turn off right away. Like the salesperson maybe says the wrong thing or there's some bad situation environment. What for you are like the top few things, which is like the easiest thing to avoid such that a consumer doesn't have a bad experience. You know what I'm talking about, right? Like when you go in the, re- there's like, there's a lot of easy ways to turn them off right away. Yeah. And, and, and again, I'm, I'm a self-proclaimed millennial, right? I, I'm, I'm, I'm 35 years old and, and I, I grew up sort of learning how to shop online. And, and so it would be very easy for me to, to grab a lot of things. And we're not just talking about jewelry, right? Or, or the watch world, you know, it, a lot of things, but as a business owner, as a, as a brick and mortar retailer, yeah. uh, I prefer to shop in person. And, and there are always those things where you say, oh, oh boy. And, you know, it, it's really interesting. I was speaking with someone the other day uh, down in Florida who uh, uh, works with some of our, our training and said, honestly, we're getting away from saying, how are you? Right. Uh, because if you really care, which, by the way, all of our associates do and we should care, if you really care about the answer to that question, you better be ready for the answer to be, oh, maybe not great. Or yeah. you may be ready for some heavy things. Um, and 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 so, you know, if, if someone's having a rough day or, 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 or someone's having a if I'm having a tough day, it's been stressful and I go out and I shop, I'm going to Best Buy or the Apple store or, or a clothing store that I love or whatever. You know, sometimes just being asked, how are you? I'm like, well, I'm fine. But you, know, do you really want to know, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and, and I think and I think that that's that, you know, that's the first thing. And, and the other thing, especially in the luxury world right now, which I think. Uh, any any retailer or any consumer who is listening to your podcast, I, I think would would this would resonate with, is you know, I, I think it's so easy to walk into a luxury store these days and not necessarily be even acknowledged. I mean, acknowledged maybe looked at, but but it, it's so sometimes difficult to to make that connection that I'm talking about. It's so difficult sometimes to get through to the person who you're who you're staring in the face. I, I can think of a lot of stores that I've walked into where uh, I've just no one said hello to me, <laughs> um, and and to me that's that's so that's such a difficult thing in today's world. We have so many options, like you said, and and it's the easiest thing to say hello. It's the easiest easiest thing, um, and and that's the first thing we say, right? Uh, is 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 everyone is greeted at the door, and and everyone is made to feel, you know. Listen, I I, I tell everyone all the time, I. If we're not doing this to have fun and to make people feel good, what are we doing this for? Um, this is this is a feel good industry. We are we are in the smile business, and um, 
you know, to, to walk into our store, everyone should feel like it's their home. Uh, and, and we do have clients who come and join us and sit down and, and shoot the breeze and, and, and grab a drink and hang with us. And, and we love that. Uh, well, there's a, I, I, again, I have to bring this up because yeah. it's an important nuance. And there is a very distinct difference, and there's also cultural variations for this, between you are welcome in this store versus I'm suspicious of you. What are you doing here? <laughs> Right? Sure. The consumer is going to more or less walk away with one of those two sentiments after they're greeted. And it's up to the environment and, of course, the person speaking to them to make sure it feels you're genuinely welcome here and noticed, meaning we're paying attention that you may need something versus, I don't like the looks of you. I'm going to be watching yeah. you. You better be doing business here or get out of my store. Like those are two very, and, and it really can't go any other way than that. It's either that or, or they're ignored. Yeah. But it's, it's, and again, cultural differences matter a lot uh, between different you know, cities and different people and different ages and, of course, different parts of the world. But would you agree that that's more or less uh, the, the, the main hurdle that, that any type of store needs to get through is hope that interaction needs to go on the right side for them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. I, I, you know, I would hope that any, any store, and I don't care what you're selling, right? If you're, if you're selling something to someone, I would hope that, that anyone would be happy to see someone walk in the door these days. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's an important aspect. That's again, thinking like a good not, business owner. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, not, this is uh, not, not to say we're in the 201 class yet, or I feel like we're still in 101. But, you know, it, it's that, that, that to me is, is, is absolutely, Absolutely. And, and by the way, Ariel, I think like, I think that there is a, um, we say, we can laugh about it here, but, but you're right in that there is sometimes that mentality. And what we always tell our team members is it's easy. We're not perfect, right? It's easy to, to sometimes, again, it's a long day. It's, it's five fifty eight, and, and we're getting ready to close the doors and, and someone walks in and you can just tell it's going to be a long presentation, right? You just know, right? And, and, and it's so easy to sort of shrug the shoulders and be out of breath and, and cause we're busy during the day, but, uh, that smile and that hello, makes the difference for that person. You never know what, what, what's walk, who is walking in that door and, and um, uh, what they're looking for. And by the way, it doesn't matter. I don't care if they're here for a, a $20 battery, a $20,000 piece. It, it doesn't matter. Um, we have the opportunity to make their day and, and to, to, to give them, again, that memorable experience so that they come back. It's a huge, huge thing. And if I could just add one extra thing. Please. Um, you know, <laughs> in the post-COVID watch world, uh, we saw and heard this a lot. It, things became, the, the, the immense demand for timepieces uh, created a world where uh, I think retailers knew that the demand was there. And, uh, I, you know, I hope not too many people got lazy. Certainly the retailers I know didn't. Um, but, but yet we heard horror stories about, oh, I was treated a certain way. And, um, you know, I, I or you I You need to given, get into some specifics here. <laughs> uh, you know, but, well, in, but, but, but in again, general, you don't have to, you don't have to, you know, uh, uh, defame the guilty, but you can, you can generally explain what, this is why I want people to recognize if they felt that be like, oh, that is bad. And for two, for the, for the, the people out there who are in this industry that are not in America, I'm always trying to educate them about their market. These types of anecdotes can be highly illustrative to understanding the day-to-day -day interactions that, that everyone faces in this country. Yeah, I, I, I think... You know, listen, every single every single retailer out there is working their butts off and everyone's working hard and everyone's trying to do the right thing. You know, some people would tell me you're you're naive, Andrew, but I think that's true. I genuinely think that we're this is a tough business. We wouldn't be in it if we didn't if if we didn't wanna wanna serve the client. Some people have, have different sort of feelings of what that looks like. Certainly a lot of the watch brands and our brand partners have, have guided a lot of retailers in terms of what the expected experience is supposed to look like. And, and, and that's, I think a great thing, but, but I think that when there was that volume of request after request after request coming in, uh, I think a lot of people felt as though they weren't being treated the way they hoped to be treated. And so you're talking um, about the hyper modern context of the last few years where certain absolutely. brands were and models were so valued that people would go either to existing retailers that did business with or try to find new ones. And unlike 
the standard treatment that most of these third-party retailers want customers to have, they were not responded to, put on wait lists, maybe spoken to by a, a, an unenthusiastic salesperson that could not meet their needs. But there was um, a, a blip <laughs> in customer <laughs> service that was relatively new and not necessarily historically precedented. Yeah, and I, I think any of that could have happened. Um, and and I think, you know, again, if you, it, it, it's just, I, there's a reason why we, <laughs> let me put it this way. There's a reason why, so we mystery shop ourselves. Um, we, 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 we take it very seriously and, and we hire people to come and, and test ourselves. Um, and there's a reason why at the end of, the, of, our, of our mystery shop, we ask the, the shopper, how did you feel when you left the store, right? right. Uh, yeah, we asked, did you use a glove? Did you talk about the history? Did you do all the right things? But the most important thing that I look at is how did you feel when you left the store? Uh, and and we give them a lot of options. And, and the most important thing I look at is, is the taken care of option. Um, did I feel taken care of? Uh, and, and I think that... Um, in worlds, and again, you're, you're right, hyper, hyper recent, right? But post-COVID, sometimes some staff was, you know, some stores had low staffing, some st- uh, stores were getting beefed up again in terms of their back of house and all of that stuff. There was a lot of paperwork. There was a lot of, uh, uh, like you said, sort of requests to go through. And I'm glad that we are... Uh, I'm glad that the it, it appears. I think I think through the help of brand partners as well as uh, through top retailers who who led the way. You know, I, I think the industry is 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 really hyper focused right now on that experience that you get in the United States right now. This is not a transactional world anymore, um, and. Uh, sell in, sell out is important, but 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 other metrics are just as important, uh, if not more important. And I'm glad that we're that that we as an industry have shifted our focus to that. So I'll give you a little anecdote that goes right into what you're saying. Um, earlier this week, I was asked to guest lecture at a university course here in Los Angeles, actually for the second time, called Luxury Brand Management. Hmm. And while I was in there, uh, I was speaking to the professor, and she'll actually be on the show pretty soon. And I was like, she was showing me the textbook. And I'm flipping through the page of this textbook. It's literally like a luxury textbook. Do a lot of case studies of the big brands and things like that. And they had these like, uh, we'll call them like maxims, like the rules of luxury brands. And one of them was essentially like, your goal isn't to sell. Your goal is to deliver an experience, which is exactly mm-hmm. what you're talking about. And I find this so ironic because even though this is such a, a known and core historic maxim of luxury that sort of is imbued in the day-to-day relationships that you have with clients, The managers, oftentimes, at the brands that you carry seem to be forgetting this important wisdom. (laughs) And there is this interesting disconnect between the the, the very real parameters within which you need to work to deliver a luxury experience and their, we'll call them corporate commoditized commercial expectations of what it is you should be doing. And I think that disconnect, at least in recent times, has probably been one of the most challenging hurdles to overcome and just trying to sort of do a normal day-to-day course of business. Any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I will say, um, maybe, you know, I'll challenge you a little there. I, I do think that certainly the brands we work with and the partners we work with have have shifted their focus to the to the experiential side. There, there's no doubt about it. Um, we are authorized dealers for, uh, as I mentioned, some fantastic brands. and um, Great brands. Yeah, and 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 we're lucky to be so, and and to to work with them, and you know, we have constant conversations around the experience that is expected of uh, those clients, and and you what know, are some whereas, things you find yourself saying again and again? Like you obviously have to report back to them regularly. What are some statements you're like, Andrew? I'm saying this again and again. Like, tell me some. Yeah, you know, I, I think. One of the things that uh, in, you know that I that I say to all of our brand partners is, um, you know, and I say this a lot is is to reassure them that the experience they expect for their customers is what Hamilton has expected for our customers for 112 years, and and right. and that is. You know that is uh, it, it's not just lip service. That that is we we've been 
mystery shopping and training on experience for for years pre covid for for forever and it's actually an entire day of our of our uh, week long new hire university program and it's it's not about selling skills or about uh, you know the, the silicon hair springs or you know like all that it's 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 about um, uh, how are you making people feel when they walk Taking in the care door of them. Yeah, taking care of them, and 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 so that's something that I I reassure our brand partners on um, because it's important. Uh, the other thing that uh, you know we talk about a lot is how the you know a, a lot of times uh, a lot of times <laughs> these these sort of uh, uh, this experience quote unquote it can be boiled down sometimes to. Uh, checking the box type of thing. So again, did you greet them at the door? Did you offer a beverage? And and those, again, they're all important. But one of the things that, that we talk about a lot is it, it's the entire thing together. Uh, if, if, you, if you miss uh, one out of the, the 10 check the box items, yes, maybe you could say you're an A minus 90%. But if the client left wowed and said, oh my gosh, all of this was the most this is the most unbelievable store I've ever been to. Uh, that can be a, a bigger win than than the loss of you know sort of the 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 watch was sideways or um, you know there was a pen mark on the tray, which of course we never want to have happen. Uh, but but you know for for us we look at the totality, and I think that that's always something keep the big picture in mind is is super super important. When there's competition in town, which sometimes there is and sometimes there isn't, why do you think consumers gravitate towards doing business with one retailer or another, especially when oftentimes, and I think this is important for brands to realize, a lot of customers aren't looking for a brand. They're looking for, as you said, experience, and they'll go and do business with that retailer that offers that experience and select from the brands they have. And so, especially in America where we have some places that are highly competitive, what do you find makes a customer want to do business with one type of store versus another that might be in the same town? Yeah, I, I appreciate that question a lot. You know, I think we have, um, especially in our position, let's give an example, you know, Worth Avenue in Palm Beach, right, where there's a, a large a high mix street of, of high streets. <laughs> right. And, and a, you know, we've been on that street since 1977, right? So we've seen it all. And a lot of, you know, mono brand boutiques have come and gone. Um, a lot of jewelers have come and gone. A lot of art galleries have come and gone. And, and you know, knock on wood, we're, we're pretty lucky. And, and, and we've been relatively steady there. And, you know, I think about uh, why that is a lot. We talk about it because um, because that's certainly a cyclical and and seasonal street. And and one of the things that that we like to talk about is again, it just feels like it's more than just a transactional type of relationship. Uh, I'll give you an example. So we're we're. You know, as we know, Palm Beach. Uh, a lot of people live there full time, but but a lot of people have second homes there and and have homes somewhere else. And right, um, you know, part of our job in in that market is knowing, you know, when someone's quote unquote leaving for the season, we have marked down in our internal CRM system when they're due to be coming back. And uh, you better believe that when they're coming back, there's a gift basket waiting for them or wow. something that 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 a phone call at the very least to say welcome back to town because I always like to tell people I, I'd love Hamilton to be your second visit after you get home after the grocery store right you come to you're coming to town you need to stock your fridge uh, and then come see us and and you know when we know when those things are happening when we know uh, people's dates and 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 important milestones in their lives we can get out ahead of it and really. Um, really sort of uh, understand the person and, and what their needs are, that to me makes a big difference, right? Even, even again, even if you just had, even if you had a lovely, very nice experience at a store, but maybe the associate forgot who you were the next time you were in, or maybe you don't get that follow-up, whatever it is, that's a huge difference from having a memorable experience and continuing the experience outside of the store. Um, one of my, just real quick, one of my vice presidents, uh, here at the company told me something early on when I started and, and I really like it. And, and, you know, she said to me, our business, you know, a lot of people say, oh, invite clients, you know, clients to, to events and, and get them there. And of course we do that. And, and, and I hope, I think people appreciate our events, but, um, what's more important is, is how many clients are inviting you to their events. 
right? How many clients' weddings have you gone to, bar mitzvahs and and christenings and and uh, and you know uh, anniversary parties? And, and that's that's a big deal. When 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 you're there, then you know that you have a relationship with a client where they will come to you uh, and shop your brands that you have. I'm so glad that you brought up that last point. It was like you're reading my mind about the 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 jeweler attending the events of the family. And I remember growing up seeing this, kind of taking it for granted. I always think it's kind of weird, like, you know, they sell jewelry, yet they're somehow part of the family. And it was this weird thing where you have to create that quasi-familial relationship. And if you ever expect the consumer to sort of invest in you, you can't get there unless you appear to invest in them. And the more authentically you do so, the more effective that that's going to be. Uh, the goal is to sort of become an extension of their family, someone that you can rely on, and most importantly, someone who makes you feel good. Because by sending that gift basket, making them feel recognized and noticed when they come home, it makes them feel good. And then when they buy that watch or that piece of jewelry, your intention is when they look at it, to not only feel good about themselves because they're wearing something pretty, but to remember how you celebrated them, their ego, um, you remembered about them, you just made them feel worth it. And that is a very complicated experience to have to, to, to present, especially since there are, as I said, many cultural nuances. And I like to remind those in distant places such as Europe, without knowing <laughs> these cultural nuances and being prepared to invest in the infrastructure required to do this, you are not going to get very far just flirting with people with ads being like, our luxury product is sexier than next. <laughs> Come in and put up with any old experience and buy it. Like, it doesn't work that way. No, I, I, you know, maybe in some markets it does, and I know there are there are differences between the U.S. and and European markets. Not in the that, biggest luxury market on the planet. Yeah, yeah, we are our our, our consumers. You know, our, our consumers know what they want, and and uh, I mean, listen, when I when I go shopping for something, I I like to think I'm well prepared and uh, relatively well researched, and yet I am still looking for an expert and for that relationship and for someone to trust uh, for for a lot of purchases. And, you know, this is like a joke in the, in the industry, but, but, you know, people say you need a doctor, you need a lawyer, you need an accountant and you need a jeweler. And there is truth to that. There is, you know, we sell things that, um, it's a dichotomy, right? They are on the one hand, technical, scientific, uh, you need, in the case of diamonds, you need a degree to really understand them. Uh, people go to watchmaking school to create them. Um, they are incredibly complicated. Um, and yet, on the other hand, they are beautiful. You know you like it when you see it. Um, you uh, uh, Things either speak to you or they don't. And sometimes it helps to have a guide to guide you through that dichotomy to guide you through, wow, I, I'm seeing something, my mind's telling me something different, or I don't know what I'm looking at, can you help me? Um, or I don't even know what she likes, but you probably do, can you help me with that? And, and those are qu questions and situations that we deal with every day, multiple times a day. And it's, it's I, I, you know, again, I, I, I hope we are good at it. Our, our clients feedback tells us we are. And, and when we hear that we, you know, made a mistake or whatever, we, we train on it and we retrain on it. And, you know, this is the type of, this is the type of relationship that, that I think is meaningful. It's, 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 it's again, that, that extra layer, that extra, that extra level that, that we can provide someone. It is, our clients are, are, are smart, they're, they're nice people. They know what they want. We like being with them. If again, if we wouldn't be in this industry, if we, if we didn't like people and like the people who are coming into our stores and we want to be that for them, we are, we are really, this is, this is what we, you know, we call, we talk a lot at Hamilton about function versus purpose. Our function is to ring the sale or fix the watch or sell that item or, hit our goal or, or, or if you're in our accounting office to close the books or whatever your function is for the day. But your purpose is a lot higher than that. It's a lot more than that. Um, and it, to, you know, 
we feel that 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 to sort of yearn for that that deeper relationship with people is um, uh, makes a difference and, and 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 people notice it. I'm looking at the Hamilton Jewelers website right now, and I'm looking at the brands you carry, and of course you have. Uh, the two big important ones, I guess you could you could say, which is the Rolex and Patek Philippe. Um, of course, you have you have other brands as well, um, and 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 I think that you have a great combination of of expensive watches, more entry level ones, sport watches, dress watches. Of course, you have to have Hamilton, right? Your Hamilton <laughs> jewelers, you have to have Hamilton of watches. Um, but I think that the last several years, especially when it comes to Rolex and Patek Philippe, were sort of unprecedented. And there's been so many conversations, of course, about that. I guess what I want to ask you is a little bit of twist on it, not what the relationship was like with the customers, because that was challenging because you didn't have everything they want to sell them, which is the position you don't want to be in or any jeweler doesn't want to be in. But what was the relationship with the brands like during that period? How did that shift? Because it was... On one sense, I'm sure they wanted to be business as usual, but it very much was not business as usual. Talk a little bit about, I know you have to be political about it, of course, but talk a little bit about some of the things that typified what the relationship was with a Rolex and Tudor in that time. And maybe how were those different? How did Rolex and Tudor approach that that level of demand differently? Yeah, so, so um, you know, I, I, this is I was referring to this a little bit earlier in the in the show, and and you know mentioned that I think thank goodness and uh, there was a a true you want to talk about relationship is a buzzword you know partnership is what we use on on the other side with the watch brands but thank goodness it was it was true with regard to all of those brands because through that time period through the last few years. Um, as I mentioned, the focus has had to shift from from sell in and sell out to more of other other things, right? Um, for the first time in a long time, the client experience was continuous for these brands. You know, uh, it was not just you walk in, you purchase the watch, and um, you activate your warranty, and 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 then the relationship that happens after is with the jeweler. No, not anymore. the 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 relationship is. You come into the to the boutique. We introduce the brand to you. We um, discuss the uh, immense differentiation between uh, uh, demand and how supply simply cannot keep up to it. Keep up with it. Uh, we uh, learn more about the client and why they are interested in a certain item. Uh, these are all things that we spoke about with with our brand partners. Um, and, and I have to say, at least from my perspective, they were with us hand in hand for most of the way. I mean, I I remember when our stores weren't open yet and we were having zoom calls with our, with our partners and, and, and sort of, you know, that's when it really began. I I have to say, I mean, obviously we're again, very lucky, lucky to have, uh, uh, partnerships for, uh, you know, 1938 with Patek Philippe, 1946 with Rolex. Um, And they value that longevity. Like that goes very far with them. Yeah, I think so. But, but Ariel, I'll also tell you, I mean, you know, you'd have to ask them, but, but I think anyone who rests on their laurels, uh, is, is, you know, that's the, I, I also think they're looking for, for what's new and what's, and, and ideas and, and what's coming next. And, and, you know, I think that, uh, and I think that that all, came, again, all came out of the last few years. Um, and, and so my answer to your question would be the, the, the true partnership was pretty remarkable. Actually, I mean, I've heard stories uh, uh, from previous generations and 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 older times in the industry, uh, you know, where where it's 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 been a little bit, it's been you know tougher. And and obviously, when watches weren't as in vogue or or weren't as interesting to some people, you know, that that can be a tough tough thing to to go to Geneva and report on. But but the lucky thing is that. Again, we have longevity and we have always been true to ourselves throughout our 112 year history. And I think that that does mean something. Uh, I, I, I hope it means something. And, and I, I see these, these, we, 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 we literally, uh, we, internally, we, we stopped calling them vendors and we call them brand partners because that right. is, that is what they are, uh, true partners. And, and, um, in the end, we want the, person who is purchasing their product to feel really good. And uh, we're learning from each other each each step of the way. We really are. Now, for you, this is a, a family endeavor. And you mentioned an important point a while ago that you chose to remain 
in the family business, which is a decision that you did not have to make. And various people in the United States in your position have gone the other way. Some have said, yes, I want to stay in the family business. Others said, no, 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 that's not for me. (laughs) What was your experience like growing up, seeing all this? And then when did you say, yes, this is where I want to dedicate my uh, my professional years? Yeah. So I, as you mentioned, I grew up in this business, um, but never had... Uh, I, I appreciate my my parents and my grandparents so much for for never ever pressuring me to to feel like this was my destiny or something that I had to do. Um, I, I I my high schools you know summers were spent at the service counter right working in service and um, you know I I learned a lot through that. Uh, and when I graduated college, there was a family rule. It was, you have to go do something else for at least two years. Uh, just, just go do something else and, and see what's out there. Uh, I did, I, I, uh, loved my, my previous career as a, as a consultant for sales organizations. I worked in sales effectiveness consulting and, um, for pretty big companies and, and I ended up doing it for seven years, uh, instead of two and, and, what I finally decided, I re- I'll remember it forever. I came home for Thanksgiving um, and spoke to my dad and I said, I, I feel like I've learned so much uh, and I apply it to a different company every three months, right? I'm on a new, a new engagement with a new company and I'm applying new things. And I said, I think it would be really cool if I could apply it to a place where I can have a real impact and a place that I can call my own. And he looked at me like I was a little crazy, but uh, through more conversations, and again, I'm very lucky to have that relationship with my father, decided that now is the right time. And my uh, team members here uh, welcomed me with open arms. I started in my first year on a full rotational program through the whole company. Uh, so uh, did everything um, from uh, inventory and accounting and uh, maintenance and sales and service and, and all of that and really sort of the ins and outs of the business. And, and uh, now here we are. And, and I would never, ever look back. I, I, I think what I tell people is uh, I love it more than I even thought. And that is because of, I really think that, again, I, I believe that this industry and what we do is a, a real, is a vehicle for contributing, really. I, I mean, we're, it sounds maybe silly. We're not changing the world. We're not, you know, we're not creating amazing medicine or, or saving lives. Uh, but we interact with people every single day. And we have an amazing opportunity to make a difference or contribute in someone's lives. I always tell people, like, thank you for letting us play a small part in your life's moment, whether it's an engagement or a, a, a graduation or you're, you're, you know, you got that promotion and you're getting that watch. You know, that's an amazing thing that we get to do. You are particularly well positioned to answer this question. And I think it's very, very important in Europe. I guess we could agree they probably do a little bit better job than us in doing a luxury brand experience, right? Like they just know how to create that a little better than us. But mm-hmm. in America, one thing that we do a lot better is sell. Okay. We are probably the most sophisticated country in the world when it comes to having a sales and marketing culture, as well as a very sophisticated consumer. Um, but in that period, when you're doing that consulting, both giving advice and learning from other industries, what are some things you can point to that are special superpowers of American sales uh, salesmanship that the Europeans maybe never figured out or just don't understand is, is something on our radar? Because I often see that strange cultural disconnect between them knowing that we'll like the product, but truly misunderstanding how we want to consume it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, to, to be fair, I, I, I did not do international engagements. I was, I was in the U.S., but I know a little something about... Yeah, uh, yeah but like you know, now that you've, you, you, you've yeah. traveled, you know them, you, you know certain things that are typified by American uh, sales and culture. It doesn't necessarily be luxury that no. you just would never find in a store in France. Yeah, I, I, you know, <laughs> there is... I, I will not forget multiple, multiple times as a, as a sales consultant when, you know, you'd come in and you go into an organization. And again, you're right. You could talk. I mean, I worked in medical device, missile defense, pharmaceutical, retail, uh, uh, you know, you name the industry, right? And one of the things that uh, was pretty consistent across the board was when you interviewed people to learn about their business, they said, they said just, just 
please don't get in my way of doing my job, right? Just let me, let me keep growing. Let me keep going. Let mm. me keep doing this. And, and that there is that, that really sort of, you know, we can call it, I think it's that really sort of American, you know, go getter big, you know, value, right. That is, that is this, uh, uh, you know, super entrepreneurial, uh, you know, it, it takes a special person to be a salesperson, I think. I th- what what I'm hearing, and again, riff on this with me, and I just just because I I, I want to make sure people understand exactly what we're talking about. It seems to be that in America, a salesperson is given, whether it's real or illusory, an opportunity to grow, to better themselves, to become bigger than their job, to escalate and promote themselves through hard work. Whereas I think in a lot of other places, a sales job is more routine, more procedural, more bureaucratic, much less of a growth position. It's that. It's that carrot at the end of the stick, which may or not exist, but seems to feel very real for American salespeople, at least in a good culture, they think is maybe what you're talking about. Absolutely. I, um, you know, I think maybe you could make the the distinction. Maybe maybe it's a it's sales versus clerking or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. I, I think uh, a lot of people describe it that way, but I can tell you. You know, one of the things that uh, uh, my my father actually says this, and he says um, he says he does does what he does for three reasons. He does it uh, one is to, is to serve our clients literally. Uh, two is to take care of this business for the next generation, and 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 here I am, and I appreciate that that was one of his three things. And then the <laughs> third thing, uh, the third thing is uh, he, he says I, I do this so that I can see our people grow. Um, that is, that is literally one of the things, one of the three reasons why he does what he does. And, and, um, I've seen it with my own eyes now. I mean, we have, uh, we have a lot of tenured associates here and people who have been, by the way, who are associates, but used to be, uh, in a different role and, and stay with our company. And we have a lot of, you know, I think, um, and I'm happy to say that, that we have attracted, um, a new crop of, of, uh, sales associates and and advisors who are in their twenties and thirties who are looking to our company as a place for growth and that gives me you know to see my peers interested in coming into a retail jewelry job uh, and see it as a as an as a opportunity for upward mobility and and to serve our clients uh, that gives that gives me you know that gets me jazzed up right because. There wasn't wasn't too long ago where you know, I think if you would have asked someone who was out of college or or young, you know, do you want to go work in retail? I think not a lot of people would have said yes. You know, I think they would have thought of that clerking job that you were mentioning before. Um, and it's so much more than that now. I mean, from from the store environment that you get to work in to the events that you get to go to to the interesting people you get to meet um this is a this is truly an opportunity if you want to grow your worldly view of things uh we have that opportunity here and 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 that gives me a lot of pleasure i hear from our european colleagues very rarely that in their sort of stepping stone of jobs to get to the the high position of authority they have at watch brand. Did they ever spend any time in retail? Um, it's I didn't really think about it until now, but I'm you know I look at a lot of uh, you know LinkedIn profiles. I do a lot of interviews. Obviously, I'm I'm curious to see how people get to their position of of CEO or CMO or something like that. And you were describing how in your upbringing you were essentially forced to spend a little bit of time in every part of the organization. That element where you ask the customer to separate from their money is arguably <laughs> the most important. It is kind of shocking how few, not, not, not none, but how few of the managers of the brands that we love, that you sell, that we write about, actually fully understands what it is like to look a customer in the eye and eventually have them decide, yes, I want to give you my money and I want to put your object on my wrist. I want to walk around and tell other folks that I'm wearing it, that I'm going to tell them a couple of bullet points in my mind, I'm going to be proud of it. Like To ask a consumer to go through all of that, especially given the fierce competition and other choices they have to spend their money. Because here's the thing, America has, and again, other parts of the world as well, no deficiency of places you can spend your money who promise (laughs) you that you'll feel good as a result. Mm, I mean, just think of the commercials we watch on the weekend, for, for example. It is just chock full of that. And so to get a customer to decide to do that is 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 so much more than saying like, hey, we're old, we're Swiss, we're stable, we're we're secure, buy us. 
And I just, I love you sharing these things because part of my job is hopefully to help the, the, the people that, that make these watches that do not have the fortune of having grown up in America to understand what it's like. Because sometimes I speak to them and I realize they think it's the Wild West. They really think we're here in cowboy hats shooting one another. And they're like, oh, I can't go into that town. I'll stick in the safety of New York City. It's kind of amazing, right? And, and I guess my next question for you is, what are the chances that you'll expand your footprint? Will you have more stores in more cities? Is it about doing more business in the cities you're in? How does right now, circa 2024, how does a company like Hamilton Jewelry grow in your opinion yeah i i think you know well i should have brought my cowboy hat i guess for this uh for this interview would be, but, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know i i i think uh says those coastal boys <laughs> right right exactly yeah i i mean well the the first part of your question right you know the the u.s is a huge market and we all know that when we do you know this the some it's it's a it's a million sub markets it's it's tiny and and uh, i will say i think a lot of the a lot of the brand partners these days have have done a pretty good job of of uh, if it's not the their executives or whatever putting people with a retail bend right or 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 have some retail experience sort of even in the positions of uh area sales managers or things like that right i mean i can't i can tell you so many of our brand representatives who come visit us um are are, are from former retail and that helps a lot to your point because um, they understand what we do every day. And you're right, the, getting someone to part with their money is the hardest thing we do. It's supposedly supposed to be easy after we've made them feel really good, but but it's still the hardest thing. And and um, and and so I do think that that also is an interesting change in the industry where where we're seeing more and more people from retail who are coming over to the watch brands and 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 who have that background. So that's been quite interesting. On the on your question about how Hamilton grows, so. We have a pretty firm belief, which is uh, we are <laughs> we're always open to ideas and uh, hearing about what's new. You know, I, I have a thing, some little thing I like to say, which is that uh, our past has to inform our future, but never define it. Um, so just because we have three stores or just because we've done something a certain way or just because uh, uh, these are our markets and it has been since 1912 uh, uh, doesn't mean that that's going to be always us. But we need to uh, let that inform what we do in the future. And what I mean by that is uh, we have this firm belief that we can really do the things that I've been talking about on this podcast with you, really being memorable, really understanding and having those deep, deep relationships with clients um, with the infrastructure we have and the stores that we have. If, if we were a 20, 30, 40 store operation, I don't think it would be the same. I, I, maybe it would be. And there are a lot of 20, 30 and 40 store operations that are really successful. Um, but to be Hamilton and to be true to our core values and what we are and who we are, uh, I think would be difficult with a lot of um, with a lot of locations. So uh, the way we grow is is through understanding our markets better, through expanding and attracting people to our markets uh, and to our boutiques and to our stores, and also finding the right opportunities. Uh, when they present themselves to uh, expand either in our markets or, or, or into to new places, but only where we know we are going to have the impact on the client that we have in our current locations. I, I, I will not go to a place where I, I feel as though I won't be able to provide the best experience to people because that's not Hamilton. Um, and, and, and that's how we look at it. I guess it boils down to the simple question of where do you put profits, right? Like you either build more stores, you strengthen your footprint. I think that's one of the biggest issues. And I'm, I'm not saying you have the answers. This is an industry-wide issue right now, but we have watch brands, retailers, uh, lots of different entities right now who are asking how to invest in the future. And one of the things I've noticed is that um, I think you guys did a little bit, obviously did some remodeling before the pandemic, but yeah. a lot of a lot of retailers not knowing what to do, what did they do? They remodeled, they opened up more stores. Um, very rarely did they <laughs> add new brands, ironically, right? They didn't necessarily invest in inventory, but they invested in themselves, which is natural and makes sense and is, is, is what I think should be doing. But it's interesting that 
that no one seems to agree on how to invest on themselves in the future. I think one of the sort of the, the gorillas in the room is the relationship with e-commerce, right? It isn't necessarily the fact that if you have this successful brick and mortar business, even multiple stores, you can necessarily translate that to doing business online. In a lot of ways, having a, a e-commerce store uh, is like another uh, uh, physical location. It has to have, um, you know, people working on it. Yeah. It has to have its own, even though it's a digital structure, it has to have things like that. So it, it's a different thing. And I guess for for you, what has that been like in trying to make those decisions about how to invest and specifically online? How have you how have you made some of the decisions? I know this is a big conversation, but um, just quick quick thoughts on it. Yeah, you know, we we have so so yeah, you're you're correct. The big question of where do you reinvest? And you said you know reinvest in themselves. We certainly did that, right? We we've done uh, our our Princeton store went through um, an immense multi year. Uh, quite honestly, I, I, so I started in our company seven years ago, one of my first meetings when I started was uh, a remodel meeting. Uh, and, and it took almost a full seven years to, to get that remodel done. We're in an historic building in Princeton. Uh, we had, uh, we did it in phases and it was a, it was a long process, but we did it. And I think, you know, for, for anyone who's, 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 you know, seen the store, I, I would hope agree is, um, one of the most fantastic stores in the country right now. You know, we are are uh, doing all of that, right, that you mentioned. And we are reinvesting in our people and figuring out, again, you know, we call it sort of sustain and scale. How do you sustain the uh, current uh, pace of, of, of retail these days and then scale from there? And really sort of building ourselves up as a brand and as a company so that we have the ability to scale into the future, which is which is good. Because the last thing I want to do is is try to to scale up or expand or, or remodel or change a, a concept or whatever it is and not have the support there to to make it successful and to and to serve the client well in terms of uh, e-commerce you know always an interesting thing for a jewelry brand I, I think as you well know and, and I'm sure some of your listeners know you know a lot of things are are determined by our brand partners, uh, what we can sell, what we can't sell, what we can display. Uh, a lot of things are also determined by our brand, our own Hamilton brand uh, uh, guidelines and what we want to show people on our website, what they should experience when we're there, when they're there. Is it is it more um, educational? Is it more of a shopping experience? What does that look like? Uh, we have literally redesigned our website from pretty much the ground up. We have replatformed. Uh, we're positioned well to um, to expand from uh, from where it is now. But I think that one of the things that we have seen success with is again. It's a similar conversation that we've been having about the in-store experience. It's the, once you visit the website, you're there, maybe you're browsing. I'm on it right now, checking it out. (laughs) Okay, so there you go. So maybe you send a chat, maybe you send an email to us. That experience shouldn't end when you leave our website, right? It, it's just like it shouldn't end when you leave our store. So, um, you know, we have a we don't use the, uh, unless we're after hours or whatever it is, or, or at least you know an initial greeting. We don't use automatic sort of replies or chat bots uh, or things like that. We have real people who will talk to you when you're on the website, and they're here. They may not be. It's it's a little after five. I don't know if they're still here, but you know they're they're here in the office, right? And and these are people who know our product, know our brand, know who the right person is to direct you to if they don't know the answer. And your experience on HamiltonJewelers.com should feel like you're in a boutique should feel like you're in a store, should feel personalized. Um, and this is the crazy thing. Uh, and maybe it's not crazy because it makes a lot of sense based on what we do. But we have people who literally ask for our online concierge to work with her and her only because that's their like sales associate, right? Right. And, and that's who, again, they built the trust over the years. And that's who um, always sends them a handwritten note with their online purchase. And, and, and those are the types of things, those little extra attention to detail that we've sort of uh, built into our reinvestment, as you, as, as you called it earlier, uh, that, again, is just a bit of a differentiator and, um, and uh, goes 
hand in hand with all of the regular investments like live inventory and uh, you know immediate sort of uh, uh, receipts and, and and immediate estimates and all of that stuff, right? That, that, that that's the kind of simple stuff. Thank you for that. We're we're almost out of time here, and I want to ask one more question to sort of muse on something you said about the um, the online con- concierge. Uh, I may have had this conversation with other members of your team years ago, and I've definitely had with other retailers. But if you go to the Hamilton Jewelers website, like some other retailers, of course, there is uh, a pretty conspicuous area that you can connect to just talk to someone right away, whether it's uh, a phone call or, or texting. That was one of the most important innovations that I was con- telling pretty much every retailer, make yep. sure people can communicate with someone right away, even a live chat. And over the last, I would say, you know, uh, five to seven years, it's become almost ubiquitous. But I remember when it wasn't and having to say, before you redesign your website and do crazy stuff, just make it so that <laughs> someone can can chat with you. Um, so I'm glad you pointed that out. And I also want to mention that that was one of the sort of easy, low-hanging fruit that I'm, I'm glad permeated. Um, yeah, the I, last- I think... Uh, sorry, Ari, I think just just if I remember correctly, uh, when we first met, I think you said to me, "Why don't you have your phone number on the top of your website?" Like, so, <laughs> like, like someone should just be able to to call you. I and probably talk to you. said that, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, and 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 I was like, "Well, you're right," and we we put it there. And of course, we get phone calls all day now. But you know, the, it's it, it's an easy <laughs> thing. <laughs> um, yeah, th- thanks for reinforcing that. Okay, so yeah, the last question, and this is for you speaking to watch brands. A lot of brands would love to be represented by a company like Hamilton Jewelers. And if you're a brand and you don't know Hamilton Jewelers, trust me, you'd love to be in their store. It's, it's a lovely environment. Thank These you. are the types of people you want representing you. But the question is this, what, what do brands need to do to impress you? You, of course, have those legacy relationships with the Rolex and Patek and others that you say go a long time, but you, you regularly um, entertain the idea of new brands and I'm sure brands come and go. What are you looking for in a brand And this is, you know, this obviously is an emotional thing. It's also a a, a sense of uh, enthusiasm, a hope for the future. But what are some of the things that brands can do to make it so that you and maybe other retailers that are uh, on on, on par at a very high tier like Hamilton Jewelers can do to make themselves attractive? Because I don't think they understand. They want to do well in America. They don't really know what's going on in your mind or what you're looking for in potentially uh, a new watch brand partner, so to say. Well, first of all, thank you for for saying that about about us, and and we we welcome. I mean, you know, we're, as you know, Geneva's around the corner, right? And and we we've got his uh, eyes are always open. <laughs> oh man, we uh so so uh, we have appointments with our existing partners and 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 some potential new ones as well. And and what I would say is it's a few things. The first is um we we always will look first and foremost for brands that that fit into our our matrix in terms of the types of clientele that we have and and our locations right um we also want to make sure that we're carrying brands that uh where um it's somewhat limited uh distribution and 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 we know that 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 you can come and 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 work with Hamilton and not necessarily go next door and and see the same thing uh that's important because we want to show our clients things that are unique and, and, and different and, and, um, make it again, memorable. Right. But I think, you know, I think what it comes down to is, is if the product is interesting, if the product looks great and, um, if our team likes it and if we think our clients are going to like it, it's just a question of, of, again, that type, that relationship that we want to have with our brand partners. We literally, yearn, I've used that word now a few times, but we yearn for this relationship that really is two ways and, and open. And by the way, I, in my first meeting with any new brand, I want to know honestly what's doing well, what's not, you know, it used to be, oh, what sells well, everything sells, right? Well, okay, let, can we have an open conversation? I'll tell you what sells in my store and I'll tell you what doesn't sell in my store. Um, I'll tell you what's tough and what's easy. And, 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 you know, if we can begin the relationship really honestly and really open about where we want to go and how we want to, 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 to differentiate the product and, and, and make it look great and uh, show it to the client and, and have someone's eyes light up when they see it, uh, I think that starts the relationship right. And I think it's, it's, 
it's the only thing we can ask for in today's day and age is, you know, if people were so, oh my gosh, so thankful that people love timepieces. People are, are into these watches. Uh, it, it's an amazing thing. People are, 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 all they want to do is come to a collector's event that we do or, or, or something like that. And now we have the opportunity to show them something new that they haven't seen in Hamilton in a long time or before. So let's start the relationship really openly and honestly and, and, and go from there. And that's, that's really the way we try to do business. I think the the wisdom that I want to reiterate that you said is that as the openness and what I want to sort of expand upon that is that, and again, I'm speaking to the brands here, don't just give the retailers a sales pitch. Uh, they're not the end consumer. They're someone you need to essentially co-opt into your family. They need to understand why you do it, what's special about you, uh, why it should be exciting to them. They're not there to deliver a sales service. They're there to be essentially co-opted into selling your brand and feeling like they are part of that process. And if you're not able to convey that to the person selling you, you sure as hell aren't going to convey it to the end consumer who ultimately should buy you. Would you agree that that's a, that's a big part of it? Yeah, I, I think I think you're right. I think again, we, we're telling stories all day, right? And 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 to to tell that story, to to be able to say that we are actually part of that brand family, uh, that we have been to the factory, or we have that direct relationship with the person who's who's leading the brand or whatever it is, that tells a story to the client, and um, that's a huge differentiator. And 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 again, I think just like. Our relationships with our clients are non-transactional. Our relationships with our brand partners are non-transactional. And, and we get it. Some of the bigger brands have shareholders and people they need to report to and, and all that stuff. But, but to be able to also say, you know, listen, uh, Hamilton, you guys are, are partners we appreciate and, and we can say the same back. Uh, that's when I think really great things happen. And, 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 and that's the differentiator. Andrew, we're out of time. I want to thank you so much, but please remind everyone where they can learn more about you and Hamilton Jewelers on the internet. Absolutely. So uh, Hamilton Jewelers is in uh, Palm Beach, Florida, Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, and Princeton, New Jersey. You can visit hamiltonjewelers.com. You can also follow us on social at Hamilton Jewelers. You can follow me personally at Hamilton Next Gen if you'd like. Uh, and uh, Ariel, I'd love to welcome you back to one of our stores one of these days. It's been a real pleasure being on your podcast. I will most certainly accept that invitation. Everyone, this has been the Superlative Podcast interview with Andrew Siegel of Hamilton Jewelers. Andrew, thank you so much. Thank you. 